Have you ever attended training programs just to walk away thinking, cool, but now what? Or perhaps you're a manager who organizes training for your team, but year after year, you're bringing in trainers and nothing fundamentally changes. So effective training isn't just about the content. To be impactful and engaging and long lasting, the program's design needs to consider the neurology of the attendees. So in this video, I'm going to introduce a few different concepts that you can consider for future programs based on the concepts in educational neurology. Hello, my name is Peter Butko, and as part of my Masters of Educational Neuroscience degree, I'll be creating a series of videos to reflect on some of the course topics that are relevant to my role as an organizational development specialist and corporate trainer. Now as a business consultant, I've designed this video really for managers that I work with who would either build, facilitate, or organize training programs for corporate environments uh, to share ideas and insights into some design considerations that should be present to maximize the return on investment for training. So this video is divided into four sections and you can jump to each section in the future by just clicking on the timestamps in the description below. So I'll start with a brief background, identifying some common challenges that managers report when organizing training. I'll then introduce the concept of neuroplasticity and discuss how the brain as a social organ links to adult learning principles. And then I'll share a few elements which will support that learning retention. And in the last two sections, I'll introduce concepts and warnings to reflect on when implementing impactful training. Now the idea is that the programs you present will change people's brains, their learning and their engagement. So neurologically, there's a real risk in running bad training. And for something different, I'm going to end on a reflection regarding the ethics around the application of educational neuroscience principles in training design. So they say that change is a process, not an event. And this applies to the integration of new skills and knowledge from training courses. So most training that we see are a commissioned point in time. So for example, staff are put on a one day leadership or presentation skills, coaching or emotional intelligence program. And then there's an expectation that they'll become better at these things. It's literally like taking someone to the gym, showing them some exercises and expecting them to walk away 10 kilograms lighter or physically stronger. Most training programs are telling. And, and by that, I mean the facilitator comes in with specific content that they intend to push on their audience. It may be a sales model or a personality profile or a leadership framework. And while this is fine on the surface, it's really unlikely to result in long term performance improvement or a return on investment if the attendee motivations, their needs or their learning styles are not considered. So a little bit of background, according to Global Newswire, in 2020, the global corporate training industry was valued at over $390 billion. So companies spend a lot of money on staff development, but then when we consider things like the forgetting curve uh, introduced by Herman Ebbinghaus, it's widely accepted that people will forget about 50% of what they've learned within an hour or so and upward of 90% after a week. Now granted, that is when there's no attempt to retain the information. However, unfortunately, that is a common scenario in most organizations. So how do we address this? How do we fix it? To answer this, I first wanna introduce you to the concept of neuroplasticity. In 1928, neuroscientist Santiago Ramon y Cajal wrote that nerve paths in adults are fixed and immutable. So everything may die, but nothing regenerates within the brain. Then in the 1980s, a psychologist named Ian Robertson observed that physiotherapy with stroke patients led to improvements that shouldn't have been possible if the part of the brain that governed movement was actually dead. And of course, now we know that while plasticity occurs more readily in younger brains, adult brains do continue to rewire and change all of the time. So neuroplasticity is literally neuro referring to neurons and plasticity referring to the brain's malleability. And we wanna consider this when we commission training programs in the workplace, because if we're investing time and money into developing people, we need to consider how that content that we present will be sustained and applied and taking an educational neuroscientific approach supports that. So what other considerations help people learn better? Well, it's a matter of taking a holistic approach to the training design. 
today I'm going to introduce a few concepts for you to reflect on. So to support positive neuroplasticity, we want to consider the brain as a social organ. So Professor of Psychology John Cozzolino presents the brain as a social organ rather than having a single function such as the heart as a pump. Uh, its purpose is to connect to other brains. So when you think about it, everything we do concerning survival, family, careers, purpose, comes down to how well we connect, network and react to the people around us. So how we learn and succeed can be enhanced by considering the social connection that the brain has evolved to master. By recognizing and leveraging the idea of the brain as a social organ, learning can be improved by providing uh, input via collaboration, socializing, exploration and observation. Now beyond this, there's also the consideration of traditional adult learning principles, as such as adults being goal orientated, uh, seeking relevance uh, of the content to their lives and being self-directed and bringing experience with them into the classroom. So taking an educational neuroscience approach to learning supports this by building on existing experience and existing neural pathways. To reinforce learning and reduce the effects of that forgetting curve, uh, we can consider building or improving neural pathways by factoring in different learning strategies into our programs. Now the brain has a short attention span and it needs repetition and multiple channel processing for deeper learning to occur. And this is important for business as most trainees assume that their education and their intelligence means that they're self-driven and they're capable of understanding and applying new things after just one event. Now, as we said earlier, one of the biggest and most expensive problems in business is that all levels of staff think that one exposure to a concept equals mastery. Whereas educational neuroscientific principles suggest that conscious and unconscious processing occurs at different speeds and that most people know significantly less than they actually think they do. If the process of learning is not considered, then the training becomes really a waste of time and money. So what are a few things that we should consider to support retention? Well, we want to activate the neurology, the systems behind the scenes that operate memory and recall. And in future topics, we can examine the impact of stress and environment on different parts of the brain and thus learning outcomes. However, for now, consider that training and post-training should have repetition, repetition, and repetition. It needs emotional resonance since uh, strong emotions assist with memory formation and anchoring. And it needs context if it's not useful, clear, important, or consistent with company values and observed behaviors, it's unlikely to be embraced. So speaking of programs being embraced, uh, neuroplasticity is sometimes seen as this exciting panacea or solution to learning. However, it happens in the presence of well-designed training or poor experiences. So we wanna make sure that we are avoiding entrenching or reinforcing unhelpful beliefs or habits. Now habits and beliefs are a potential paradox for neuroplasticity, since the brain adapts to what it does most. So beliefs and behaviors which are rehearsed and repeated are likely to become more entrenched. And this is also an essential consideration regarding resistance. Like with cognitive dissonance theory, if you force a new belief on someone, you'll likely encourage them to find evidence to support existing beliefs. Uh, this triggers repetition, emotion, bias, and they go looking for data, all of which is going to reinforce the behaviors and strengthen existing neural pathways. So in short, these principles are not only present for the good programs, in bringing in poorly designed workshops, you potentially expose your employees' brains to processes that reinforce negative beliefs about learning, about self-image, or other aspects that you're actually trying to change. Now finally, there's the question of ecology. In NLP, when we work with people to change their timelines, their beliefs, or how they code experiences, we always assess those requested changes against the behavioral and lifestyle impacts that those changes may result in. So applying a conscious approach to literally rewiring people's brains with targeted interventions and designs that raises potential ethical considerations. Does it start to enter the realms of subliminal conditioning? Uh, can educational neuroscience be used uh, in marketing or political voting and affiliation? Can it change social opinion? Who has the right to apply interventions which change other people's brains and likely their personalities, life experiences, and relationships? 
And should this be something that a teacher is authorized to do? Should there be stronger accreditations and ethical frameworks? Now, if you think about it, we are our brains. And if people are employing techniques to actively change people's brains, they are assuming a right to change those people's personalities. And sure, I'm not suggesting that designing a program to be more memorable is likely to cross any major ethical lines. However, if we're talking neurology, we need to consider the interconnected network that forms a person. So in making changes in one part, can we be sure that we're not changing the necessary automated responses that allow them to survive or thrive in other areas of their life? So I propose that an educator is a guide, not a superhero as I've seen it suggested. No educator should presume to know what a person needs or what their overall existence is about. Therefore, their role should be to achieve a clear, transparent learning outcome and utilize tools and approaches to make the process as effective, efficient, and collaborative. Now, as a guide, an educator can help someone test, experience, and apply new skills and knowledge. They should be there to support integration. However, their role should not be to impose it or to reprogram a student based on their own opinion or their interpretation of the benefits. And this ties back to the ethics of educational neuroscience. If you don't know the overall effects of changing one part of the brain, then targeted manipulation becomes dangerous. So neuroscience as a design consideration to corporate training, is it a good thing? In short, absolutely. Uh, there are specific activities, interventions, and approaches designed to trigger emotional and physiological responses in participants, which drive skill and knowledge development and maximize investment by improving retention. So in summary, people's brains change based on what they do and think, and the way that we present information or methods of training which leverage socialization, emotion, and context, and ensure the appropriate neurology is stimulated to better drive memory formation, retention, and recall. Now, understanding the mechanisms behind thought and personality makes it possible to better support individual styles, gaps, and preferences, and the individual needs. Corporate training should always be aligned with a specific strategic need within the business, and it shouldn't be a single construct that claims to solve all of the world's problems. However, combining corporate strategy and educational neuroscience into our session designs can ensure a long-term commercial and cultural benefit for all participants. And given the social purpose of the brain, this can only support admirable personal and professional competencies and characteristics. So if you're unfamiliar with educational neuroscience, I hope this video gave, uh, gives you some food for thought when it comes to commissioning or creating training for your teams. And with any luck, it'll guide you to choose training partners who really consider these factors that will lead to sustainable development solutions. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you got to share some of the, the passion that I have for this topic uh, and people development in general. And of course, if you feel that you or your teams may benefit from unique, tailored approach to development, then our contact details can be found in the description below. Until next time, thanks again for watching. Remember to hit like and subscribe uh, to keep up to date with our content, and let us know your thoughts in the comments below.